Welcome to GDC Showcase. I'm Chris Graft, Editor-in-Chief of Gamma Sutra. I'm joined today by a very special guest for today's AMA session, uh, Gavin Moore, Creative Director on the new Demon Souls for PlayStation 5. Uh, I see people have already started putting in questions, and if you haven't, go ahead now, start submitting your questions via the question tab in the chat box there in the bottom right. Uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can. And with that, Gavin, thanks for joining us and please introduce yourself. Hi, Chris, thank you so much for having me here today. It's, uh, it's great to be with you all the way from Tokyo in Japan. It's a little early here in the morning, 7.15. So excuse me if I'm just gonna drink on my coffee here. When remaking and remastering a game, how do you decide which bugs uh, from the original to keep or fixed or fix based on modernizing it uh, player expectations or or other reasons is that yeah um thanks jay for that really difficult question <laughs> you know that early in the morning to start off with um that's a really 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 difficult um process there are a lot of bugs that actually become meta in a game right and um it took a long time um, Demon Souls took three years to make, and I can tell everybody out there, nearly every day we had those discussions. We went through that list and we ticked them for, yes, it's going to be fixed, or no, it's not going to be fixed because the community yeah, want to keep that sort of bug. So we look at a lot of uh, background online to see what people are talking about and what they're into and what they're not into. And, you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult decision. I mean, there's no real yes and no answer. It's not black and white. It's something mm -hmm. we investigate. Yeah, that is a great question. Like for, for being seven in the morning, uh, that's really good. Uh, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna go to uh, Steven real quick. Um, how did your role as the creative director change um, in a good or bad way over the course of the Demon Souls remake project? So when I was asked to come on board with the project right at the beginning by the executive producer, Asakura-san, um, I spent many sleepless nights, I can assure you, right? This is a PlayStation gem. It's a PlayStation classic. It's beloved by so many people across the world. And to take on that responsibility is um, not taken on lightly. So I would spend sleepless nights worrying, first of all, what Miyazaki-san would say. And then I would send uh, the next month not sleeping, worrying about what the fans would say. Um, and then eventually you just have to, um, you know, hitch up your trousers and get to work basically and um, believe in what you're doing and believe in the passion. So over the course of the game, I think my trepidation um, was overtaken by my passion for what the game is because it's such a spectacular game. And so I wouldn't say that I wasn't passionate at the beginning, but the more I delved into it, the more I became passionate as a creative director to make sure this was the best experience to, for a whole new generation of gamers. Thanks for that. We're gonna go on to another one from uh, Emilius. Uh, any advice you have for an up and coming designer with dreams to become a creative director? So it took me 20 years to get to where I am now and I've been in this position for 10 and it doesn't get any easier and the one thing you have to keep is your passion and your drive and if you can't get out and out of your bed in the morning because it's raining too hard or it's too cold to go and work on that game that you love then you shouldn't be working on that game so keep the passion um, the other thing I would say is good advice to anybody out there is that when you start a game Right? You start off with a core experience that you build upon. And over the core course of you know, making the game, how many ever years that may be, things change and the game evolves and it takes on a life of its own. So don't be afraid to keep reevaluating what that core is because you might have put a feature into that game which you thought at the beginning was great and was working, but a year or so down the line, it might actually be hindering what the game could become. So always examine what you're doing and be brave enough to cut something out of a game as much as you want to add to it. Hmm. You take one from Alexis. Um, how do you think one is able to maintain the soul of a game in a remake? That's a great question. So um, when we look at doing a remake or a remaster, um, we've gone well beyond 
remasters now. It, they really are true remakes. Um, we try and identify, as Alexis said, the core, the soul of the game, and that is what we keep. Um, you know, working with Blue Point was incredible. Working with Marco and Peter, the um, chief technical officer, and how they work and how they sit their engine over the top of the existing engine and strip away everything apart from what we identify as that core or the soul, which for Demon Souls is the AI and the gameplay. And then we build everything back on top of that. So the collision, the camera, you know, obviously the graphical elements, the sound is built over the top. So even in Demon Souls on the PlayStation 5, you're still running the core programming essence of the original on the PlayStation 3. It's very cool. Um, we'll take one from Chris that's getting uh, some upvotes here. When creating a game as difficult as Demon's Souls, how do you balance difficult gameplay with intuitive mechanics and usability in general, uh, making game hardcore but engaging and fun um, to keep enough users playing? Is that something you could speak to? Uh, yeah, at 7.30 in the morning, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's It's... It's not as difficult as people may say. Um, I think a lot of the frustration with the original game of Demon Souls and, it, and how people thought it was too hardcore came around because the actual system it was running on wasn't capable of running it properly. And the frustration of the load times and you know dying and then waiting two minutes for it to load to run back and die again i mean it just made you pull your hair out as you can see i played the game back in 2009 so um so keeping the original core of the game as we as i just talked about maintains its essence so you're not changing that in any way so you're going to keep that heart core feeling um but we have to think how games change over time and how games evolve and how gamers change and expectations of what a AAA title, you know, have changed in 10, 12 years. So it's important that we made those decisions very carefully about what we would add and what we wouldn't add, um, how accessible the game should be. You know, obviously making a game on the PlayStation 5 with new features, you know, super fast SSD, you know, the new controller with the haptics feedback, this was always going to change the game. We had to be very careful how we were going to implement those, you know, user experiences without changing the original. Um, Melissa asks, uh, what kind of challenges have you faced while working in Japan on games as a foreign de developer? I, I, um... I, I don't experience any anything, any challenges in the sense of being a foreigner here. Japanese people are very open uh, in the workplace and in society to, to everyone. I think the challenges um, are the way that the working practices here are different from in the West. It's very common for a team, any team member in the West to speak up and speak their mind. It's not so common in a Japanese development team, but it is something that, um, you know, in Japan studio that we worked on very heavily to make sure that everyone has a say in the development of the game. Um, and to say, it's okay to speak up and to speak your mind and to be creative. I mean, everybody that works in games is very creative. And if we're not listening to them, then we're losing a precious resource. Uh, Tremaine asks, hey Tremaine, seeing you around this week. Um, can you walk us through a typical day of being a creative director, such as any pressures, responsibilities, enjoyment, et cetera? The, the 7 a.m. Uh, AMA is live AMA is probably one of them. <laughs> yeah, one of those. Uh, I usually get up around half past four uh, and um, I just scan my phone for all of the emails and the messages and stuff. Um, get to work, you know, start work around, you know, half six or seven. Um, games are a global experience now, so I would have calls in America, both uh, in uh, Central Time in Texas and obviously in the West Coast in California throughout the day. Then I would get online, obviously this is all work from home for a year because of, you know, 2020 and COVID. So I would get online and talk to my team, um, go through every aspect, and then in the evening I'll get online with Europe. So I could be doing everything from playing the game, writing up notes, um, 
<clears throat> to different members of staff, you know, chatting with the art director in Texas about the way I can't see the, you know, how it, how the game plays down this corridor or this character doesn't look correct, or it could be talking to a composer <laughs> or, a, you know, in, in California or, you know, going in into the, you know, music recordings in London or, you know, being in the voice recordings in London, directing actors or, you know, everything, every aspect of the game has to be covered in, in the general day and everybody is just as important as everybody else. You know, it's a massive team effort. That sounds like a lot of work. Um, Valerie. It's a lot of fun too. <laughs> Yeah. Valerie asks, uh, with Demon Souls, uh, you got to develop a Souls game. How different is it to direct a Souls game from any other game? What are the main challenges with Demon Souls? I think Demon Souls challenges that it has legacy, it's history. You know, it's the first of its kind. It's um, a game that spawned a whole new genre of gaming, you know, and there are incredible expectations and um, you have to be very, very careful in what you're doing. As a genre of game, I think the basic rules of how a game plays and the user experience are generally the same, regardless of any game that you're playing. You know, you can apply the same rules. It's just the Demon Souls with the Demon Souls title, um, you have to be respectful of its legacy. Uh Samuel asks, uh, Demon Souls re uh, the Demon Souls re remake was built only for the PlayStation 5. Um, was the decision to target the newest hardware made early on? So we started off the development um, on the PC, like all of our titles do. We work heavily on the PC and through, and then as we get dev kits, we um, continue that pipeline. The Bluepoint engine is incredible, the way that you can adjust something on the PC and it will adjust it straight onto whichever platform you're working on or whatever you, you can see on your screen. Um, but yeah, originally we started off on the PC um, and then as we started to get specs through for the PlayStation 5, we started to think about all the different features that we could adjust and add. Um, but it has always been a PlayStation 5 game and a PlayStation 5 exclusive. Um, Gia asks, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing names, uh, what is your team's process to identify uh, the soul of a game that you were talking about earlier when remaking a game is the process? So that, that's, a, that's a lot of discussion. Um, you know, I, I think with a game like Demon's Souls, it was always going to be, um, it had to be its AI, it had to be the way that the characters moved um, and the timing of attacks, you know, none of that could change. And so we spent a lot of time maintaining that. I mean, we re-motion captured the whole player animation sets and we added a whole new female animation set that never existed in the original game, but all the cadence had to remain the same. And that was weeks and weeks of motion capture to make sure that we were getting exactly what we needed so we wouldn't change that soul. Um, so I, I think it was quite easy on Demon's Souls to identify uh, that essence, you know, the actual core gameplay. It was much harder, I think, to make sure that we maintained the feeling of the game, the despair that the world brings across. You know, we were adding a lot more visual assets into the game uh, because we had a lot more power than the PlayStation 3. You know, the PlayStation 5 is incredibly powerful and we wanted to, you know, showcase, you know, that world is the best way we, best we could, um, especially with visuals and sound. But we had to maintain that feeling of despair that Miyazaki put into the original game. Harris asks, um, as creative director, how do you balance leading your teams to achieve your vision with giving them the agency and support to come up with their own ideas? It's a lot easier on Demon Souls to do that because everybody has groundwork to work on. So that everybody knows what, you know, a base to work on. If you're making an original title, it's um, a process where I would lay down um, what I believe, 
And that this would be either that could be a story, that could be game ideas or game mechanics, uh, level ideas and level designs. And then I would usually split the teams um, across each of those levels. So you would have um, animators, you know, environment artists, character artists, game designers, you know, working on each level together as a team. And it's up to them at that point to, um, if they come up with ideas to present those ideas and uh, for us as a team to come to a consensus about it. But as a creative director, you have to make that final decision yourself. Um, and it's not personal in any way. You just have to look at the whole of the game, you know, in, in its entirety and make a decision that that is the correct thing for the game. Thanks. Uh, Chris asks, uh, what, is, what are some of your favorite memories of remaking this game? So as a game, I think some of my favorite memories are just watching the game evolve and grow. That's always great on any game that you work on. You know, to look back where you came from and look at where you, you, know, you are at the end is incredible. Um, most of my favorite memories are just the great times with, uh, you know, all the different teams around the world. And, you know, there's a great, great people that work uh, both in Sony and at Bluepoint and uh, a lot of fun times together with those people. Nicole asks, uh, how did designing next gen hap haptics for the PS5 controller change the game? So that was, um, one of the hardest things you had to do. I mean, if you were making an original title, you could make original game mechanics that would literally use the haptics in, in different and you know, novel and exciting ways. Um, we wanted to use the haptics, um, uh, but we didn't exactly know how we were going to do it. And it wasn't until we actually got the, the controller in our hands and felt how the haptics would work. Haptics is incredibly different from uh, the way that a, just a normal dual shock would work, just a vibration. Um, it works uh, in, you know, together with both sound and visuals. All three have to work together. So they have to be designed together. So you can't just add it at the end, like we used to do with, you know, dual shock and vibration. It has to be something from the beginning of the game that you're thinking about all the time because you're always going to add sound and visuals working in, in harmony together. And the only way we could do that in Demon's Souls, as far as I was concerned, is to make the combat grittier, right? And by feeling and sensing the, you know, the hits and the strikes and the blocks and the, the whoosh of Vanguard's axe as it passed, you know, as you rolled underneath it was an incredible sense that I was suddenly, you know, thrown deeper into the combat. So it really did enhance the game. Um. Brian says, hi, Gavin. Uh, Blue Point seems to be one of the studio's most dedicated to high frame rate tech in the business. Can you speak um, as to why 60 frames per second is so important to your studio? I think um, 60 frames a second probably is, <clears throat> compared to PC gaming, is probably pretty slow at the moment, right? Um, I, I know that my son doesn't like anything that drops below 240 hertz when he's on his PC. Um, but every time that you increase the frame rate, um, you increase the fidelity. You know, you increase the feeling, the emotion. You feel, you know, that you're pulled into the game more. You feel like you're a better gamer because the game's giving you more chances. You're seeing more. Right. And um, so it is incredibly important to make sure that any tech that we produce now, especially on the PlayStation 5, has to run at least at 60 frames a second. Um, David asks, if you could remake any game you want, what would you remake? Oh, my God. See, I would have remade Final Fantasy 7, right, mm -hmm. because... I just wanted to remake the scene when Seth, Sephiroth kills, you know, Aerith, and I was just like, no. Nah. But then they remade it, so I'm like, okay, they've done that one. Um, what would I remake? I'm not sure. There are so many great games out there um, and so many great gaming experiences that, you know, you, I would love to revisit. Um, childhood gaming experiences, for instance. I'm not sure a lot of them would hold up, but in my head, they were just amazing experiences. 
Um, let's see, well, who else we got here? Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, sorry. What qualities would you say a creative director must need to be successful apart from the passion that you talked about earlier? And that's from Amelius. Oh, there, there, I, hmm. <laughs> there's vision. Um, you have to listen. That's incredibly important, right? You have to listen to the people around you because everybody has an opinion and everybody around you is creative. And you have to make sure that you're listening to them. I think mean, there's a famous line in um, Game of Thrones where Jon Snow's told like, you know, to be a leader, you have to follow, right? I think that's incredibly important. You have to learn, you know, everybody's job, basically. Not down to the minutiae of it, but you have to know what people are going through and what you're ordering them to do. You know, it's not it's not good enough to go and make that character and go and make it like this and I want it in a week, right? You can't do that. You have to understand the processes and the workflows and, the, you know, how long it takes and what people are doing and how much of their life they're pouring into your creation. And you, therefore, you have to be respectful and treat them with respect. Tremaine asks, um, what were some major hurdles, if any, uh, that the team experienced uh, doing the remake outside of the pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah outside of the pandemic. Um, I think our major hurdles were always about uh, making sure that we were being true to the original. Right. Um, you know, we'd learned a lot. Um, Blue Point and, um, you know, Japan Studio had learned a lot remaking Shadow of the Colossus. And it wasn't until that title was made that we felt that we could take on um, Demon Souls and do it justice. And um, so we knew that we could make a great experience and we could definitely um, give you incredibly outstanding audio and visual and sensory experience on the PlayStation 5, but it was always going to be, are we doing the original justice and, and are we always stay, remaining and staying true to that original vision? Misha asks, um, in comparison to the Dark Souls series, do you feel player progression is something that needs to be kept? Uh, and she says, I found learning about the progression in Dark Souls a very useful benchmark. <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> uh, but you have to differentiate the Demon Souls and Dark Souls are two completely different titles. You know, the Dark Souls series is, is a child of, of Demon Souls and Demon Souls is the first of its kind. And that's not to say there are many design issues and changes that um, were made in the Dark Souls series, you know, as the, as the original development team learned more about what they wanted to create and how they felt that that game should play. Um, I think Demon Souls though stands up, you know, even today as a classic. And um, I'm just glad we got the chance to remake it and bring it to a whole new generation of gamers out there. Ibrahim asks, uh, what would you recommend an aspiring game designer from Europe uh, who wants to work abroad, for example, in Japan? Learn Japanese, right? Um, definitely learn Japanese. I've been here 18 years and I'm still terrible. So um, that will help you immensely. Um, if you really have the passion and you really want to go to a foreign country, I think the best way to do it is pack your bags and go to the foreign country, right? Find a means to get there, you know, live your dream, get on that plane, you know, whatever it is, get to that foreign country and then, you know, really start applying to companies and get your way in. And it doesn't matter how you get in, get in at any level. And then, you know, if you have the passion, you'll get to where you want to be but it's not going to come to you. You've got to pick up your boots and get there yourself. Uh, Tremaine is asking to for you to remake Legend of Dragoon, LOL. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would do that one. I like that one. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see, this one just popped up. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Michael asks, how have you balanced creative direction slash vision with, uh, with schedule restraints or, you know, I don't expect you to get into like what you were working on with budget specifically, but those kinds yeah. of restraints. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not going to talk about budget, but Demon's Souls is not a cheap game at all. And it shows, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a triple A title. It stands out there on its own. And we were very lucky to get the backing to do that. Um, I think schedule wise, you know, you always believe as a creative director, there's always another six months if you are kind enough to the executives and you say, look, it's great. Don't you, you know, and they're like, yeah, but you know, and we are like, well, just give me six more months and it will be even better. And you're, you know, with a launch title, you don't get that option. That's a drop dead deadline. And um, it's my first launch title in 24 years of working at Sony and it was a complete honor to make it but it was incredibly difficult, um, you know, knowing that we had to go into QA and testing and, uh, and, you know, pushing and pushing and pushing to make sure that, you know, the game was ready for that so we could get the feedback and then have enough time to implement it. Always with the thing that, you know, on, in November, the hardware is going to launch and we have to be there with it. Yeah, that's kind of a hard, <laughs> hard stop there. Yeah, yeah, it's a hard stop. <laughs> uh, Kylie asks, we've got a few more minutes, so get your questions in. We'll try to get to all of them. Kylie asks, uh, especially working remotely, how do you keep your team in alignment and make sure everyone has access to the development resources they need? Okay, so uh, a year ago, literally a year ago, we packed up everything. Uh, everybody took home their equipment. Um, set up everything in the house. Uh, we tested everything before we left the office to make sure it would work. Um, so I have literally in my living room, which my uh, family hate, I have a massive desktop PC, two 4K monitors, a, well, obviously my TV that I use most of the time. That's why my family hate it. And uh, a massive PlayStation 5 dev kit and an assortment of other equipment. Um, how do you keep them in line? It's a lot of um, relying on them as professionals, right? You know, we don't treat people like children, that they're professionals and they will do the work and they'll get on and do it. They have a passion for what they're doing. And, you know, you just have to trust in people. And, you know, team structure is very important with that. It's also very important to make sure that you're online with them, you're talking to them and that you're accessible to them, whether that's through, you know, Line, Slack, Zoom, you know, WebEx, whatever, you know, whatever it may be that they can chat to you if they have a problem or they, they need advice. Um, Sari asks, uh, how do you, as a creative director, fight uh, creative blocks? They put in, in quotes. <laughs> you don't. There's nothing you can do. Okay. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I have ideas in my head where I've, literally stopped working on them uh, for years because I've come up with a, something in a story, for instance, that just won't work. And then suddenly you can be in the shower, you can be driving, you can be, you know, cooking, you can be doing something, you just go, oh, okay, that's how it's gonna work. And that's when suddenly you rush back to that idea and you start jotting things down or writing things down. There's no way to get over a creative block. You know, some people I know, will sit there and bang their head against the idea forever. And there, some of them are great and they can work through it. Me, for myself personally, I, I just leave it alone. I'll, I'll let it go and work a different tangent on the same you know, project or jump into another idea and work on that for a while until inspiration strikes. Mm -hmm. Mowing the lawn also helps. Uh, yeah. Give has that. <laughs> Any, any of those normal mundane daily things where your mind drifts away mm -hmm. and you become, you know, you're not involved with it anymore. It suddenly wants to jump back in and take control again. And that's when that, those blocks, you know, end up disappearing. All right, 10 seconds. Kelly asks, what qualities do you look for in the members of your team? Passion, love for what you're doing. Um, they're all skilled. They all have a lot of experience um, 
and a willingness to learn and a willing to be open and a willing to be creative. And that's all the time we have that absolutely flew by. Uh, Gavin, thank you so much for uh, getting up in the morning. I know you're super busy and taking the time to do this. Thank you for, to everyone in the audience for giving us great questions to work with. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, you know, for having me today. And thank you to everybody out there. And I hope you enjoyed Demon Souls. And I hope we can make new and exciting experiences for you all there. And I hope to see you around in the industry. Take care.